Uh, is everybody listening? Okay. First of all, thank you. Um, I think I'll change a little bit the 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 main uh, approach. I'm going to talk about more mechanistic and more an overview about how we uh, we deal with proteins in the neuroscience uh, field. Um, so if you have any questions in the middle that can uh, make it easier to understand the next steps, uh, I'll be glad to answer. So uh, um, I had a, a quick pass through protein crystallography before I went to neuroscience. So uh, and I was, I was very interested about how proteins worked and how structure was linked to function. So in neuroscience, it's, uh, it's amazing because you have so many interesting questions that goes from the everyday life to the very intricate aspects of the brain and the, the neurons work, that you can always go to those uh, tiny little pieces of molecules to try to, to see how we understand how uh, the amazing functions of the brain do. So uh, first, we know that these electrochemical reactions that occur in the brain, they're somehow linked to our thoughts. But we don't know yet how exactly it turns out as thoughts, as perceptions. And we have a hint of how it works to lead to our movements, so the motion. So, but what we know is that we have 100, around 186 billion neurons. Each neuron has around 10,000 connections with other neurons. And uh, in some specialized neurons, they can fire, they can actually be activated 1,000 times a second one kilohertz. So the main questions uh, in neuroscience goes through how these different levels, different scales come together to produce thoughts, movement, and behavior. But from our perspective, we can never let it pass that there are different kinds of brain, different sorts of brain that you see in mammals, but you also see in invertebrates. So in these brains, you can see similarities as convolutions, suicide. Uh, you see different size in different animals. So they share a main structural uh, pattern that you can look from the outside, but you can also look from the inside. So it helps a lot because when you cannot do experiments in one species, you can move to the other one and to get some insights from cellular aspects or from molecular aspects in other species. So this is our brain. This is 1.5 kilogram, irrigated with uh, many vessels, arteries, veins. It needs a lot of supply of oxygen and glucose. And it has a lot of uh, uh, consumption of glucose. It's organized in layers in the cortex that when you move from one animal to the other, you see that there is a conserved pattern of organization of the cells. There is this radially distributed cells that has intricate links with each other that at this type of analysis, we cannot get it from here. You just look, you see just the, the cell bodies of the cells. So each blue dot here, it's a, it's a cell. Most of them are neurons. In the cortex, what you have is 85% of your cells are neurons, 15% are uh, 85% are excitatory neurons and 15% are inhibitory neurons. So all the circuits in the brain are basically constructed from excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And so the combinations in different shapes of circuits, networks, actually will produce an output from one input. So, but the brain is not only composed about from neurons. There are all the supporting cells that make up the tissue. So these red cells here, these are glial cells that they help neurons to keep track with their activity, supplying basically lactate, because lactate is the main uh, energy source to neurons, not glucose. Even though glucose passes through, through the vessels to the brain, but lactate is actually transported from the astroglial cells to neurons. So this is typical cortical layering with pyramidal neurons projecting their processes throughout the layers 
And here we have just a still picture. You don't have the functions. But the function is actually what we are looking for, to know exactly what is the pattern of activity of each one of these neurons. And the clue, and the actually the, the answers are in understanding what makes a neuron act and function uh, as it, it, it does. So uh, as you have different kinds of neurons, you're going to have different patterns of membrane proteins organizing the flow, the, f uh, the transport of, of ions across the membrane. And this excitability, that's, as we say, uh, is what governs the probability of a neuron to fire in one specific situation. So this probability can be higher in a situation depending on the, on the state of the, of the tissue and can be lower in another state. But if you're talking about an excitatory neuron, to be lower, to reduce the probability of firing, it means inhibition of the system. But if you talk about it, lowering the probability of activity of an inhibitory neuron, you're actually increasing the activity of the system. So uh, when you go and you get an anesthetic, because you go for surgery, you're actually reducing the whole brain activity so that you don't feel pain and you don't move. So, but how neurons are? So neurons are very specialized cells. So they're not as an egg or as in a red blood cell, as is a round or a spherical cell, where the nucleus is, is basically uh, sitting in the middle of the cell. Here you have this cell that is very weird, actually. It looks more like a star, but with process that can go from 50 centimeters to 100 micrometers. And along all these membranes that actually cover the cytoplasm and the exoplasm, you have a different pattern of organization of proteins. It's structural proteins, you have enzy enzymes, and you have uh, ionic channels, ion channels distributed here. Uh, the basic functions of neurons are exerted from its arbor of inputs that we call dendrites, that generates then an activity that propagates and goes all the way to the end, to the axon. And then this electrochemical signal, this depolarizing wave that occurs here in the axon, is transformed in exocytosis of neurotransmitters that then is again transformed in this depolarization for the other cell. Basically, this part of the neuron it's covered with what we call spines. These are mushroom-like uh, protuberance on top of the dendrite. Most of the excitatory inputs to a neuron enters in each one of these small dots. These dots here, later on, we're going to call it the postsynaptic site. That's where we're actually interested in studying. And you can see here. But along the axon, after the dendrites, along the axon, what you have is that the axon is covered with pieces of membranes, leaving some spaces where there is a high concentration of sodium, voltage gated sodium channels. So the nerve impulse propagates throughout the nerve, the, the axon, jumping from one node to the next node with, in, with inward current, positive current going in, and depolarizing and propagating node by node until it reaches the synapse where it releases neurotransmitter. But the signal that comes here is just one. It's just one of these inputs. But how can a neuron decide if it's going to fire or not to fire? Because basically what happens is that in the in the initial segment of the axon, there is an integration process. All the inputs, excitatory and inhibitory, that comes into the, into the dendritic tree is integrated here. And this integration, what is it's actually uh, doing this integration? It's just high concentration of uh, voltage-gated sodium channels that can only open after a certain level of depolarization. So the depolarization that comes from all these inputs are sensed here, and if it reaches a threshold, they all open at once. 
And as sodium is very highly concentrated outside the cell, the electrochemical potential pushes sodium into the cell, and there is this huge peak of depolarization. And this peak of depolarization propagates node by node until it reaches the end. And at the end, a series of processes that will release the neurotransmitter occur. But different neurons in different parts of your brain, for example, in the cortex, but in the thalamus, in the cerebellum, in the retina, they fire differently because they are, they are formed differently during development. And if you record the firing patterns of these neurons in each area of the brain, this is a rodent brain, you're going to see that some neurons fire in bursts and then reduce. Other neurons are fire regularly, and other neurons fire very fast with small pause and fast again in small pause. Usually, the neurons that are fire very, very fast, they are inhibitory neurons. And they need calcium binding proteins in the intracellular to keep track with the calcium levels because calcium is very uh, dangerous to cells. So calcium is very pro-apoptotic. It, it leads cells to death. But what I'm going to talk today is more or less at this level. But I just wanted to show you that the levels that create behavior is at the level of the circuits. These levels create behavior. But any effect that happens here at the synapse or at the membrane will affect the organization of how the firing patterns of circuits will occur. Uh, so protein expression in the brain, 75% of, of the brain express proteins of other tissues. So just a small fraction is actually enriched in the brain. This here doesn't take into account the splice variants that you may see for different protein, because a specific protein can have different isoforms, and it's not taken into account this. This is for the frontal cortex. But those are for the frontal cortex, but the frontal cortex has astrocytes, has other kinds of cells. But so if you just separate by cells, you see that there is a cluster, a cluster of proteins that occur particularly in neurons. And these proteins are usually related to or the differentiation process that separate cell lineages from astrocytic cell lineage, oligodendrocytes and neurons, and also for synaptic proteins, so the proteins that are actually involved in the in nerve, nerve impulse, the transmission of the signal. The class of proteins that are enriched in the brain they comprise basically proteins, membrane proteins related to neurotransmission, but also proteins that are involved in signaling, intracellular signaling, as kinase, phosphatase, linking proteins, cell adhesion, and proteins associated with differentiation. So to make a summary, I would say that some of the important class of proteins in the brain, you can see ion channels, of course, receptors, for light, odor, mechanical, receptor copper refactor proteins. Here you can see kinase proteins, neurotrans neurotransmitter synthesized enzymes that you can find in excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons differentially, calcium binding proteins, and synaptic proteins. So I will stay here at the synapse because the synapse is a site where many of the disorders, very subtle disorders that are not related with huge movements or or lack of memory, but schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder, or uh, ADHD are related to synaptic proteins. Synaptic proteins, they can be divided in, in several compartments where they are. So the synaptic compartment, there is a presynaptic compartment because it's the axon. There is the cleft, the space between both neurons. And there is this postsynaptic site where you're going to find the receptors of neurotransmitters. So we're going to talk about some of these proteins quickly. So here, just to show you that there is a terminology being used nowadays that's called synaptopathy, uh, disorders of the synapses. 
So these functions of proteins related to the synaptic function. So autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, Alzheimer, some of them, some of these epilepsy are have proteins associated with the synapse that are changed. Here's to show you that every small dot here, in, in red you have the nucleus, in blue you have just cytoskeleton, but in green you have the synaptic context, this cell received from input cells. So uh, it's a myriad of inputs having to be integrated in the initial segment of the axon to give an output. But before integration, there are graded processes occurring inside the cell after each one of these depolarization or hyperpolarizations. We call depolarization when the cell becomes more positive inside and hyperpolarization when the cell becomes more negative inside, so flow of chlorides inside the cell. So basically, quickly, when the impulse comes here to the end of the axon, vesicles containing the neurotransmitters are released dependent on calcium entrance. Calcium has to enter the cell to make the vesicles to be released. Once the vesicles are released, neurotransmitters bind to receptors, and some of these receptors are ion channels. And some of these ion channels, they have high conductance to sodium or calcium, and it will have a high increase of calcium or sodium here inside the cell, making the cell to depolarize. And then you have an effect in the cell. This is just one of those inputs the cell receives. So it has to be integrated later on. This here is an electromicroscopy of, of, the, of the synapse. Here you see the presynaptic side with the mitochondrion providing energy for the cell and the, the synaptic vesicles. You see the cleft, the space between the presynaptic membrane and the postsynaptic membrane. And you see a, a thick electrodense labeling here in the postsynaptic membrane that is related to the concentration of receptors. If you talk about, in terms of time, when when a depolarization comes to the presynaptic site, right after that, calcium channels open, voltage-gated calcium channels open, and there is a flow of calcium inside the cell that makes synaptic vesicles to be released. Once the synaptic vesicles are released, afterwards, the neurotransmitters binding to the receptors promote an, in an inward current in the postsynaptic cell. This inward current in the postsynaptic cell generates a change in the postsynaptic potential difference across the membrane according uh, related to the extracellular space. So this is a series of quick events that are continuously occurring in different brain areas at different frequencies and synchronized in different ways with different brain areas so that you can coordinate. So if I throw a ball and you catch the ball, the sensory motor coordination for you to catch the ball is what we're talking about, is this coordination between areas and at the synaptic level. Each vesicle in the presynaptic side is a vesicle that has an, appar has an apparatus to uh, control its release. And different proteins were already purified. And one important thing is that for the vesicles to be filled with neurotransmitter, they pump protons to the inside of the vesicle, becoming very acid. And this high concentration of protons is used by the transporter of neurotransmitters to pump in using the gradient of concentration of the protons to fill the vesicles with, uh, with neurotransmitter. So the energy of moving towards the, 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 the electrochemical gradient of proton is used to transport against the gradient the neurotransmitter inside the vesicle. This is how the vesicles are, are filled in. 
But once the vesicles are close to the membrane, when the, when the action potential, when the impulse, nerve impulse comes, there is an apparatus of proteins related or linked to the membrane of the vesicle or to the presynaptic membrane that are calcium sensitive, that needs calcium to actually to clamp the membrane and provide the force necessary to fuse one piece of lipid with this other piece of lipid against this soluble thin layer of cytoplasm. This fusion, this energy to this fusion is provided by the set of proteins that are called the snare complex. So, and in the other side, so this is this side, this is the presynaptic side. The postsynaptic side is the other side of the next neuron. Usually it's these spines that are spread all over the, the, the dendrite. So if you see here, this is peak one pier. This is current going in into a specific spine because synapses are, are made specifically at each one of these spines. And it can be controlled and regulated specifically in each one of these. So you have an input of current here, but you don't have it here, 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 or not here. On the other side, what you see, this is the presynaptic side. This is the postsynaptic side. The postsynaptic side is usually called postsynaptic density. And this density is related to the, the receptors, the neurotransmitter receptors. And here you have actually an apparatus that first has to cluster the receptors. The receptors ha have to be clustered around the active zones, the zones that release the, the, the vesicles. They're not equally distributed uh, along the postsynaptic membrane. So the, the, the receptors are clustered, and the clustering of receptors are carried out by a set of proteins that regulate this, uh, the, really the, the, the clustering. Besides that, if you get a piece of tissue and you make an homogenate of that tissue, and then you take that homogenate, you pass through several centrifugation process, and you go to the microscope, you can see that this piece here keep together. You cannot break this presynaptic plus postsynaptic. It's called synaptosome because of this linkage, this interaction between the presynaptic membrane with the postsynaptic through membrane proteins that make this structure very strong. So across development, when the, the baby is born and start growing, synapses start getting stronger and stronger, and you are born with many more synapses than what you're going to have by the age of 18, for example. You have a pruning of our synapse. And the pruning of our synapses is regulated by competition between synapses. The synapses that are more used, they get stronger. And the synapses that are not used, they get weaker and they disappear, they retract. But when you learn things along your life, your synapses are actually becoming stronger and weaker based on the molecular apparatus that makes it this structure uh, compact. This is what we call plasticity. So brain plasticity, it's structural, but it's functional because the functional comes from the structure of this, uh, this, uh, this complex, the presynaptic and postsynaptic, the synapse. So uh, ion channels, I'm going to go quickly here. Voltage gate ion channels, they are gated by movements of domains, helix, and the intracell in the intramembrane uh, part of of, uh, of the structure move based on the dipole that is created across the membrane. So once the cell depolarizes or hyperpolarizes, these channels can open. And the specificity of the channel for a specific ion will make the cell hyperpolarized or depolarized. But some channels are gated by ligands. And some of these ligands are neurotransmitters. Other, others are small molecules inside the cell. 
So here you see uh, these are sodium voltage gated sodium channels. And what makes things difficult for neuroscience is that not only have to do with different isoforms of these channels, but they are also distributed in different brains, in different brain areas differently, and in different compartments of the cell. So when you talk about a specific isoform of a protein, you get to know exactly in which compartment of the cell you're talking. You're talking about the dendrite, about the cell body, because the inputs coming to each of the compartments brings an input from a specific area. So here you see that in red, you see the labeling for, for the sodium channel. And in green, you see uh, structural proteins that actually keep the channels exactly at this position. They position the sodium channels, not allowing the, 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 the channels to diffuse laterally on the membrane here. So these are uh, inward rectifying potassium channels. That there are several subtypes of these cells, these this proteins, and they're distributed in different compartments of the neuron. And you can see that they can have different distributions with some overlap. But depending on their sensitivity and gating property and kinetics, you see different response in different sorts of neurons. Uh, I'll talk about uh, the neurotransmitter receptors. One class, one family of neurotransmitter receptors is this pentameric ligand gate and ion channels that has some uh, family members in prokaryotes, in other organisms. But what is interesting is that they share the primary structure organization of transmembrane domains and uh, similar, but they respond to different neurotransmitters, for example. This here is for acetylcholine that is related to memory, to attention, to cognition. But the other one is, respo is, is responding to serotonin. Serotonin is related to anxiety, relaxation, digestion, and GABA and glycine. There are two other bind binders to, the, to these receptors that are related to inhibition control by excitation. So the excitatory inhibitory balance in your brain is, uh, is taken care of by the, the GABAergic uh, neurotransmission. So uh, as I said, they share similarity with, with other uh, proteins from prokaryotes. And they have a kind of a similar structure with transmembrane and this uh, extracellular domain where the Usually, the, the ligand binds in the interface between two of the subunits. They, sh they have two alpha and three beta subunits in this case. This is the first structure that was solved uh, um, with the most commonly found uh, oligomeric structure uh, of the acetylcholine receptor. But the serotonin receptor that is has a completely different distribution in the brain and is involved in a different kind of functions. Uh, also has similar organization uh, with the core. One aspect that is similar between both is that both are uh, permeable to sodium and to calcium. Sodium basically has the function of the polarization to change the, the, the polarization state of the cell. But calcium, besides the polarizing the cell, calcium brings an effect of activating different sorts of, of signaling cascades. Uh, another protein that is very important to keep the synapse and is involved in, for example, in, in dysfunctions associated with autism and schizophrenia is this protein called norexin. And norexin has, has uh, a partner, a binding partner, that is neuroligin that keeps the synapse, the synapse intact. And so uh, this structure has several, uh, um, the protein has several isoforms. Each red small domain here is excised or is kept in the different isoforms. And the ligands require or 
do not require the presence of this red segments of during splicing. So all those that are with a plus here are proteins, are binder bind partners that need or doesn't need this splicing event here. So it generates a lot of diversity. And this is a different isoform of the same protein. There is this long isoform and this short isoform. And this is a model of how these proteins interact in the synapse so that they can make it more stable, less stable, uh, the synapse. One of the effects of having mutations in, this, in these proteins is that you have a labile state of synapse in different parts of your brain. So you have cortical cells, pyramidal cortical cells in layer two with mutations, with changes in the structure. You're going to have problem specific circuits there in, in layer two or three related to this dysfunction, right? So, uh, but not only these proteins, nerexins, bind to their partners, neuroligins, they also bind directly to receptors. And they bind directly to receptors using a link, a protein called, for example, cerebellin in this case, but there are other proteins that make links and coordinate the activity and modulate the activity of the receptors, neurotransmitter receptors. So they're not only structural, but they can also modulate the function of receptors. This is another protein that was found, C1K. It was found originally in the immune system. But more recently has been shown that in the, in the nervous system, in the brain, it has an important function in keeping the synapse structured and functional. Well, just to cite, this is of interactions with other proteins and the association when mutations occur or deletions to schizophrenia, autism, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. So, but to finish, uh, I'll say that uh, recently, 2000 on, uh, proteins, photosensitive proteins found in, in microbes, in photosensitive microbes, were engineered to be used in neuroscience in such a way that classically we used to activate neurons using electrocurrent. We used to stick a pair of electrodes, very thin electrodes in the brain, and pass very quick pulse of current, 10 microamperes, 5 microamperes, to simulate the brain area and to record in other brain areas is to see how the circuit worked after this impulse. Transmagnetic simulation is much less specific, spatially speaking, but with these proteins that are sensitive to light, we can actually direct the expression of these ion channels, photosensitive ion channels, to specific cell types. So I can put these specific proteins in excitatory neurons of layer five of your frontal cortex. So with these proteins in layer five, pyramidal neurons, I can specifically excite or inhibit those cells during specific behavior or during experimental design that I decide to do. This is what, what is called nowadays optogenetic. So these are basically proteins that are sensitive. They change their conformation state and open a channel by uh, the absorption of photons of a specific uh, light wavelengths, blue or green. And they are proton pumps, they are chloride pumps, or they are channels that are uh, permeable to cations. Uh, I just have to mention here that there are other proteins that were also engineered that are not channels or did not conduct you know, ions through the membrane, but they basically they activate metabolic cascades. So they can activate specific cascades inside the cell by activating, by putting light on it. So this is the spectrum of 
responsivity in terms of time. Because if you're talking to use a technique where you design proteins to control neuronal behavior, neuron activation, you need to be able to get close to the activation kinetics of a neuron that is around one millisecond. So otherwise, you're going to be slow enough to get an answer or get a response later on. So there are set of proteins already designed that are, that are close enough to have a, a, a physiological effects. To say that how we do it, we do a, a small surgery, we introduce this fiber optic into the brain after the animal ha received the virus that transduced the protein in specific cell types. And then we link the, fiber the optic fiber here and the laser, we control the laser with TTL pulse and we give the TTL pulse based in any specific behavior design that we do, we decide. This in green here is where the protein was expressed in particular types of cells. And when you shine light, you see action potentials coming right after the light. So the cells respond after the light was, was on. So basically how it works. You excite the cell, the cell fires, and you can control the firing pattern of the cells and do your experiments. Or you can also inhibit, and you see the the firing rate inhibition after you inhibit the cells. So you can also excite, you can either excite or inhibit the group of cells. Um, well, I think uh, that was what I wanted to, to present to you today. It's more uh, a larger perspective of how in neuroscience we, we like to get close to those who are working with proteins to try to understand uh, functional aspects. And basically, we do this to answer some of questions that we have here in the Brain Institute, that some basic questions, how circuits work, but also some applied questions related to disorders associated to the nervous system. Thank you.